Good evening, and welcome to BMT InfoNet's webinar, Donating, Donating Bone Marrow and Stem Cells to a Family Member, What You Need to Know. My name is Marla O'Keefe, and I am the Director of Outreach for the Blood and Marrow Transplant Information Network, or BMT InfoNet. And I'm happy to say I'm an unrelated donor. I was an unrelated donor in 2002, so this webinar has particular interest to me. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I need to review. If you have a question, please type your question into the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. This is how we will be taking the questions at the end of the presentation. Dr. Our speaker, Dr. Michael Pulsifer, will answer questions at the end of his presentation. The presentation is being recorded and will be available to view online after the webinar. If you are not familiar with BMT InfoNet, we are a not-for-profit organization that provides patients and their loved ones with high-quality, easy-to-understand information about bone marrow, stem cell, and cord blood transplants. We have many publications, a peer support program, and a website filled with information for patients, caregivers, and donors. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Michael Pulsifer. Dr. Pulsifer is the Medical Director of Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and co-chair of the Donor Health and Safety Committee of the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. Dr. Pulsifer is an internationally recognized expert on donor health and safety. He is currently principal or co-principal investigator on six national multi-center studies and a co-investigator on multiple additional clinical trials. Dr. Pulsifer has authored more than 140 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including Journal of Clinical Investigation, Blood, and Nature Genetics. He has written five book chapters and presented widely at national and international conferences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Pulsifer. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be able to spend some time today and talk to individuals who are considering doing a wonderful thing, I, I would say, and that is donating uh, either bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells to a family member. There may be some on this call also who are uh, unrelated donors in the National Marrow Donor Registry, and some of the information that I'll share today is uh, relevant to that as well. Um, at the end of this, uh, uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, take questions from you, so um, uh, go ahead and write them down as you have them. You have the ability to do that um, so that you remember them uh, when we uh, come to that particular part of the presentation. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind uh, is, is a reminder. Why do people donate either bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells? There are really three main reasons to do this, and um, I want to mention all of them uh, so that you, you have in mind really what you're doing. The majority of uh, donors are donating in order to help their um, uh, family member uh, or in an unrelated donor situation help um, uh, an individual who they don't know um, uh, overcome cancer. Uh, what happens with uh, the process of doing a bone marrow transplantation is two things. Um, the uh, patients get very high dose therapy that minimizes um, their uh, uh, risk of relapse uh, that can occur with any cancer. Um, and then what occurs is they get a graft versus leukemia effect, or when that bone marrow goes in, it can see the uh, cancer in the individual as different. Um, uh, and when it sees that it's different, it can then um, fight and kill cancer, which is a very important uh, thing. Um, the second thing that happens with bone marrow transplantation is you can just replace a dysfunctional marrow. Many times, again, your family member or, again, unrelated donor situation, the person who you're donating to, donating to, will have a problem with their immune system. The marrow is a wonderful organ. It happens to be my favorite organ. And um, it, uh, people don't really think of it as an organ, but it is. Um, and it does three very important and essential things. Um, it's your immune system. It helps you fight infections. 
uh, and can help you fight cancer. It's, uh, it makes red cells that are important for carrying oxygen to the body, and it makes platelets that are very important for clotting. So whenever the marrow doesn't work well, and there are a number of disorders uh, where the marrow doesn't work very well, a bone marrow transplant can fix those disorders. The final thing that um, bone marrow is used for in some cases is gene therapy. There are a few disorders uh, where um, uh, children especially uh, get an inherited um, disorder that's usually an enzyme defect that causes um, serious uh, problems uh, with their ability to live normal lives. And um, bone marrow transplant can be used when your white cells from a donor can be distributed throughout the body and deliver an enzyme to different parts of the body. So in other words, getting a new bone marrow allows um, us to de deliver this enzyme to places in the body where it wouldn't be um, otherwise in a patient who has that gene defect. So those are the three main reasons uh, for donating bone marrow, and all very, very important uh, for patients who are very, very ill. Um, so here's this slide that you can see is, is very important to note. Um, and what it is is it's something that, that uh, mentions just part of the story here. Um, uh, but the important thing uh, to mention is this line right here. Uh, this is a sibling donor. Now what you can see is the sibling donors, uh, brothers and sisters of those um, uh, who are, are, are donating, um, there is an improve, uh, uh, the best outcome, and it always has been the best. Now over time, um, unrelated donor um, uh, outcomes have gotten a little bit better, and that's a good thing because it gives you a little slack if you can't donate. Um, but uh, sibling donors have always been um, the best donors, the ones that have allowed uh, the best survival. Now, this only goes to 2005. Right now, the um, difference between siblings and unrelated donors is very close. Um, but because you get a lot more complications associated with unrelated donor um, transplantation, even though the survival is very similar, we always like to do a family or a sibling donor um, when we can. Um, now, um, there are a number of different uh, types of uh, donors that are used in the United States in order to do bone marrow transplantation. And this slide um, illustrates through the years um, what we have done. Um, when bone marrow transplantation was started, it was almost always with sibling donors. And only uh, later on did unrelated donors begin to um, uh, increase very dramatically. There's this other category here called other re relative as well. There are a number of donors um, that donate who aren't a, a sibling match. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see here toward the end, there's been a big increase in those type of donors. Now, what type of donor is that? Well, originally, along uh, uh, back here, most of the donors were those who weren't quite a full match. Um, they had a single mismatch. Um, but uh, as time went on, we developed ways of doing mismatched donors, and we have something called a half-matched or haploidentical donor. And over the last couple of years, um, Simple and very uh, important techniques uh, in order to use half-match donors have been um, uh, developed, and that has allowed a lot more related donors to donate. Um, so bottom line is related donors contribute very significantly um, uh, to the number of transplants that are done in America. And unrelated donors, um, of course, are the most common uh, right now um, uh, because uh, uh, not enough patients have good matches. Um, this next slide um, talks just a little bit about the advantages of having a related donor. Now, um, when a recipient uh, receives a bone marrow, um, uh, they uh, have uh, what I want to call a uh, uh, your, your friend is your enemy um, a relationship with something called graft-versus-host disease. That new bone marrow can go into them and um, what's great about it is uh, that that bone marrow can restore um, their uh, bone marrow after it's been treated with intensive therapy, and they can return to function um, very uh, early on. The trouble is um, many of them can get what we call graft-versus-host disease, where you can get a skin rash or severe diarrhea or liver dysfunction, and you can develop a chronic form of that that can cause uh, a lot of 
issues um, with the recipient. It's a, it's a good thing in a way to get a little graft versus host disease because it prevents relapse or decreases risk of relapse, but a lot of graft versus host disease is not good for anyone. And related donor bone marrow um, tends to give less graft versus host disease, um, which is good. They return to normal function earlier, they take less medications, um, and visit the hospital less, less often. The second advantage to having a related donor uh, is that uh, every once in a while, you need a second infusion of cells. Um, sometimes your your uh, new bone marrow is a little bit weak and it's not doing quite what it, it needs. That can be because of infections or other complications that happens early on in the process. Um, but other times, um, we see hints of the cancer coming back. And in that circumstance, if you treat it early with a second infusion of cells from the donor, then you can bring it under control and often cure it. Um, so it's nice to have uh, a related donor situation if the related donor is available um, so that uh, you can potentially use um, uh, that related donor uh, for second uh, infusions. Um, now, here's a, a slide that really illustrates something that's um, important to understand. So um, the, whenever you do something in life, of course, you always want to know, well, what is it? Does it give me any advantage? Um, the most important thing to understand is that the, the biggest advantage you get from donating is not for you, but it's for the person who receives your donation. Um, in other words, they're the ones who, who have a potentially life-saving procedure that they couldn't have had otherwise or a safer life-saving procedure. Um, so they're the ones that are getting the big benefit. But I believe that there are a couple of other things that are advantageous uh, to the donor in the donation process. And this has actually been shown when um, studies have been done. The first thing is that um, we can reassure you that this is a safe procedure. It does have complications associated with it. And as I discuss the complications that occur um, in the rest of this talk, I hope to uh, provide uh, some reassurance. There are some things that seem scary, but they're not. Um, uh, there are rare complications that can occur, but by and large, the vast majority of patients have good experiences and um, the complications or uh, discomfort that is associated with um, the uh, donation process is very mild. Um, in addition, something that's very important to reassure people about is that there's really no long-term damage to your own bone marrow. Um, we actually just finished a very large study that we're publishing of patients who donated a second time and showed really no um, problems at all. Uh, you can donate bone marrow many, many times. You have plenty of it to go around, and it just grows back um, very nicely. But I think one really important um, uh, it, benefit that you can get from uh, transplantation is an emotional benefit. It's really um, m most of the people who donate feel what they should feel, and that is that it's a privilege to be able to help out. Um, you, you, you know, when you're a, a donor, you're in a, in a situation where you're um, uh, providing something that many other people can't provide. It's, it's a unique thing that you can provide, and to help save your family member's life uh, is a real privilege. Um, you can tease them in the future and tell them things that they owe you, but uh, although I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but, uh, uh, but it is a, a real privilege to do that. And you should, and definitely no matter what happens with the transplant, have a strong sense that you've performed a very important service. And, and I want to underline saying that, that uh, no matter what happens in a transplant, whether it's successful or not in curing your, your family member, you've done a great thing and you should uh, keep that in mind. Now, um, there are a couple of other things that I want to talk about that are on the other side. Uh, and that is that you as a donor have the right to privacy and you have the right to um, uh, make your own decision and um, resist family pressure. Um, now, one of the things that uh, is, is very important to understand um, is you as a donor um, are a patient in a way when you go through the process and learn how to be a donor. You um, uh, are entitled to full privacy regarding all of your medical conditions. Um, and that's something that's very important. And uh, the reason for that is that 
Um, on occasion, you may have a condition that you don't want your family to know about. And if that's the way you feel about it, it is your right. Um, and you should understand that and stick to it. You can keep things private. Um, and um, uh, uh, there are some circumstances that you ha can have medical conditions where your recipient doesn't need to know them. Um, now, um, one thing that I should say that there are a few conditions that you may have uh, that can affect the health of the donor. And in these circumstances, you will be asked uh, to, uh, if you feel that it's appropriate for you to reveal um, this information to the recipient. Um, those conditions uh, are conditions where you could potentially give them um, a disease. For example, there are donors that have hepatitis, um, hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Now, um, it's not, you can actually be a donor if you have hepatitis and your recipient can receive medications that will minimize the chance of getting an infection, um, but sometimes it's better um, to do the donation from a related donor who has hepatitis than it is from another individual. Um, but because you, you would be potentially giving a, a disease to a patient, um, you, you would be asked to share that information uh, with the patient. Now, many donors uh, have no worries and are happy to share their information, um, but uh, many donors don't want to share specific information about their health, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you feel that way, you have that right and privilege. And one thing that's very important, um, there is a process that all transplant centers go through um, of accreditation. Accreditation is a way that transplant centers get a stamp of approval from a national organization that says they're doing transplants the way they should. And um, what they have been required to do uh, over the last few years is provide donor advocates. In other words, you should be able to have someone you can talk to at the transplant center who will be your advocate and talk to you and give you advice if you're feeling hesitant about um, the donation process. In other words, someone who's on your side and your team. Um, now, that brings us to this issue. What if you are, you just can't bring yourself to do it? And there are a number of reasons why individuals um, might feel that way. One thing I want to state and state very clearly, bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cell don donation is a voluntary act. Um, and you should uh, not do it unless you are willing to donate. Um, there is a big uh, and wonderful group called the World Marrow Donors Association that is um, dedicated to doing donor uh, studies. Um, I'm running a national group uh, through the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research that does donor safety studies. We support a donor's right to refuse. If you, if you don't feel good about the donation, um, um, you know, for whatever reason, you have the ability to refuse. It's important for you to understand that an alternative donor can be obtained in most cases. Um, there are unrelated donors and cord blood donors that can um, uh, uh, donate rather than you in almost all cases. Now, the risk profile will be different uh, with a cord blood versus unrelated donors, but survival is uh, very close, very close. Um, if, uh, again, you uh, didn't feel that it was good for you. And it's especially important for you to feel that way if you have health conditions that may affect your ability to donate. Do not feel like you need to donate if your health is not good. Uh, so bottom line is, if you're not feeling good about donation, one thing that I would recommend is that you don't get your blood tested. It's, uh, when you're tested to be a donor, generally it's a one in four chance that you're going to be a donor. But um, once you find out that you're a complete match, then all of a sudden the pressure gets a little bit more intense uh, from your family members. So if you really feel that you don't want to donate, um, it's probably best just to say, um, I don't feel good about being a donor and I'd rather not be tested. That way um, you won't have that extra pressure. Now let's talk a little bit about that testing that I just mentioned um, uh, to find out whether a related donor is the right donor. So the first thing to um, understand is that we are looking in a donor for what we call an HLA match. Now HLA, 
stands for human leukocyte antigen, and those words mean human white cell protein. So this is a protein that's on the surface of white cells. White cells are your immune cells that fight infection in your body, but they also are the guardians. They're the cells that keep foreign organs out. Um, they they uh, can cause rejection of or organs. Um, the HLA proteins, again, help you accept or reject organs. Um, we test for a number of different HLA proteins. We do A and B, and now actually we do C and DRB1 and sometimes even DQB1. Um, but uh, these um, uh, proteins that are tested um, then are, are, are compared with your, your uh, recipient uh, family member. Full siblings can match at all of these antigens, and if they do match, then that's great. They're um, the best donor. Um, if you don't quite match, um, you could be what we call a single antigen mismatch donor because every once in a while, um, these genes uh, kind of cross over and get mixed up, and so you could be a not quite a full match, but just a one antigen mismatch. And if that's okay, I mean, if that if that occurs, you still could be the best donor for your family member. And as I mentioned before, nowadays we're doing a lot of what we call half matched donors, where only um, uh, out of looking at A, B, and maybe C and D R and D Q, um, there's two of each of these, and um, uh, that means you have 10 different things to match. Sometimes if you only match in half of those, it's five of them, it's still good enough for you uh, to be a donor as long as you use the haplo approaches. So this is what the HLA um, genes um, uh, kind of look like. This is a, a funny representation, but bottom line is this is what a protein looks like. It's, it goes on the top of the surface of the white cell. And, and again, this, this protein on the white cell feels around and tries to sense uh, other proteins that are there. Every brother or sister has a 25% um, uh, chance or a 1 in 4 chance of being a complete match because they can get this from dad and this from mom. Now, um, one of the other possibilities are the two blues going together, um, the red going with the blue in addition to, to this. Um, uh, so bottom line is there's a uh, there's four different possibilities, so um, only a one in four chance that any given brother and sister will be a complete match um, for HLA. Now, how does the testing occur? Um, the transplant center that you go to will have a way that they like to do it that they think is best and most efficient. Most centers do a blood test. Um, some centers will, um, uh, rather than do that, request you to scrape your cheek. Um, when you scrape it, scrape it good and hard because you actually have to collect some cells that line the surface of your cheek. You then send it into the lab, and you can know the results usually in four to seven days, and you've got to throw a little mailing time in there if you're getting tested uh, from a distance. <clears throat> Now, um, the question then is what level of match matters? Now, as I mentioned, standard transplantation, we're going to test either six or eight of, of those genes. Um, sometimes people test even more nowadays. They'll test 10 or 12. But for related donors, we, we oftentimes don't need to, to do elaborate testing of a lot of the extra um, uh, matches. Um, and as I mentioned, you can have that crossover match where maybe you've got a single mismatch and you oftentimes can be used um, uh, as a donor. But if you're a half match, you can still be used. Um, by definition, all parents are half matches uh, to their children, and all children are half matches to their parents. And this is occurring now very, uh, you know, in, in many situations because we're using half matches. I know of a situation where a grandchild was asked to be a donor for a grandparent because now patients are undergoing transplantation um, at, uh, at older ages. Now, um, what happens if you have, you know, you've got a big family, and uh, so you've had sibling rivalry all of your life, and all of a sudden, um, uh, now you've got more than one uh, who is a match uh, to the donor, uh, to the recipient. How do you decide who then should be the very best donor? Um, there are a number of general principles 
But what will usually happen is that your transplant center is going to think very carefully about it and come up with who they think are, is the best donor, and it's going to be based on a number of things. The first thing that we think about is age. In general, younger donors um, are better. And so, um, you know, once you're over a certain age, once you're over 40 or 50, then it doesn't matter. Um, and pay, uh, sibling donors go uh, until about age, um, let's see, I think the oldest donor on the a big study I used to, I just finished was 73, I believe. Um, so you, you can donate um, until you're uh, well into your 70s. Um, but in general, uh, if you do a donation from a younger donor, it works out a little bit better. How about um, uh, sex? Now, um, usually uh, uh, it's best to get donations uh, from the same gender. Um, uh, interestingly, the big uh, risk is uh, women who've had multiple pregnancies. That can increase the risk of more serious graft-versus-host disease, which you know, may be beneficial in certain types of transplant, but in general what we try to do is we try to give a male um, uh, donor to males, um, and uh, when we use female donors, it's best to have the, uh, donors that haven't had multiple pregnancies. Uh, blood type matching isn't isn't uh, vital. You can actually um, do a donation if you don't have um, the same blood type. Uh, the eventually the new bone marrow will make its blood type, and you'll just replace your old blood type with your new blood type. But if you happen to have a blood type match, then it just makes things a little easier. There's a virus in um, many of us, about 80% of us, once we get what we call a CMV infection sometime in the first 10 to 20 years of our life, um, we have this virus living in our white cells, uh, generally for the remainder of our life. It doesn't bother us um, unless we happen to be very immune suppressed. Um, but if patients have had this virus infection, having a donor that um, has had it is preferred. This is actually not quite right here. Um, and if a patient has not had CMV infection, then having a donor that has not had it uh, is preferred. Again, I didn't quite state this correctly. Um, and finally, uh, we take into consideration um, whether you can consent. Now, uh, when children undergo bone marrow transplants, uh, of course, their brothers and sisters are almost always children as well. Um, and uh, Donors younger than 18 uh, absolutely can donate and have donated very safely through the years. Um, but what we tend to do is uh, we try to um, uh, allow um, adults to consent if possible. Um, but again, bottom line is your transplant center is going to tell you who the best donor is. Now, even if you match, there may be reasons why you won't be able to donate. Now, what would that be? Here's the key health of the donor. When we assess donors, we fully realize and understand that a donor is doing something um, of their own free will, and they don't have a health problem. They just happen to be a donor. So our first obligation is to minimize the chance of any harm occurring to the donor. So bottom line is if, that, if you as a donor have some health issues, you know, you you might want to think twice about it. Now, there are a number of reasons why we just don't allow donors for sure right off the top. If you've had a history of recent or current invasive cancer, it doesn't make sense for you to be a donor. If you have an active serious disease, especially an autoimmune illness, we don't want uh, you, you to uh, go through the risk of being a donor or potentially give that illness to your, to your um, family member. If you have a blood disease, um, of course, we don't want to give that blood disease to your recipient because um, you would give that. If you had sickle cell disease and you were a donor, you'd give that to your recipient. You can transmit in, uh, potential infections, um, so we do our best to screen for infections like HIV, hepatitis, etc. We also very much do not like um, uh, doing donations during pregnancy or nursing um, as uh, it can cause um, issues, and we certainly would not want to put the infant at risk. And finally, donors receiving experimental medications, um, we, we like to uh, avoid uh, so as not to cause any problems with the donation process. Now, um, there are a couple of other reasons uh, that are associated with the two types of donation, bone marrow and peripheral blood stem cells. First 
if you've had a history of serious reactions to anesthesia, we're not going to make you do a bone marrow uh, donation because you'd have to have general anesthesia to do that. If you have very severe uh, lower back pain, probably not a good idea to do this because it might exacerbate your lower back pain. Now here it says older, greater than 50. Um, a number of older individuals do donate bone marrow, but of course the older you get, the more challenging the procedure is, and a lot of centers prefer to do older donors with peripheral blood stem cell collections. For peripheral blood stem cells, you have to get a medicine called GCSF. Um, that medicine, uh, if you have an allergy to it, of course, we'd be careful about that. There are a couple of things, um, uh, diseases, this is a, these are diseases of the eye that are known to be exacerbated by GCSF, and so we tend to um, avoid that. Um, uh, sometimes patients with a history of clots have been um, excluded, although uh, we did publish a study showing that it doesn't necessarily increase your risk uh, of clots. Now, um, once you're known to be a match, um, what can you do? There are two major methods, and then there's a third method that is a combination approach. The first approach is bone marrow harvest, and the second is peripheral blood stem cell collection, and then there's a hybrid where you get GCSF um, that you usually get just before peripheral blood stem cell collection. You get it before a bone marrow harvest. So let's talk a little bit about those two. What happens with bone marrow donation is you go into the operating room, you're getting general anesthesia, so you're asleep through the whole thing. You don't feel anything at all. You might have a little discomfort because you get an IV placed. Um, then what occurs is you're put on your stomach, and we, we uh, do a bone marrow in your posterior iliac crest. There's this little area right in the very back of your hip. The only purpose for it to be there is, is just to harvest bone marrow from. I mean, it really doesn't support anything. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to do a bone marrow harvest. And what you do is you take a needle, uh, go through the skin just in one place, so when you're done with this, you don't really have a scar or anything. Um, and that needle then is inserted um, several times into the back uh, of the hip, um, and bone marrow is removed. It looks like blood when it goes out um, uh, of uh, the body, and it's then collected uh, and sent. The second method is peripheral blood stem cell donation. This very happy, smiling donor um, has had IVs placed, one in one arm, one in the other, and what is occurring is um, the blood goes out, it is it's spun, um, white cells are removed, and blood goes right back in. Now, this donor has been primed with Neupogen or GCSF for five days by a, a subcutaneous shot. Um, that priming of GCSF causes his bone marrow stem cells to go out of the bone marrow and migrate through his body, so it's circulating all through his blood, and that allows uh, that donor then to be collected through the safe racist procedure. Um, you're hooked up them to the machine generally for about four hours, and most of the time you just get it in a single day, but many times it takes more than one day. So what are you more likely to get, a bone marrow or a PBSC harvest? That really depends on how old your recipient is. Almost all patients nowadays, um, as we've gotten better and better data on the pediatric side, they do better with bone marrow, and so um, bone marrow is usually the preferred uh, source. Whereas on the adult side, um, what you can see here is that peripheral blood or PBSC is collected almost all of the time. Um, so it's, it's rare that um, bone marrows uh, are done uh, uh, on adult patients. And so this is mainly because the diseases are different, the approaches are different between adult um, bone marrow transplants. Now, um, uh, I mentioned a little bit about haploidentical. Um, here it's 50-50. Um, the haploidentical are half-matched patients. Um, they uh, started m uh, doing uh, mainly bone marrow, um, um, but uh, very quickly people did peripheral blood stem cells as well because they were doing uh, an approach where they de depleted T cells. Um, and when this newer approach using post-transplant cytoxan came along, all of a sudden both of them increased um, pretty significantly. So if you're doing a half-matched, then it's going to depend on your center and the disease, uh, whether they're going to ask you to do bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells. Now, what are the side effects of bone marrow donation? Um, this um, is, an, is an overview, and the challenge with this, of course, is that it lists all sorts of possibilities. I'm going to sh go into a lot more detail about the more common potential side effects that can occur. 
Um, uh, these you can see are the common side effects that can occur in, in a majority of patients. So a little bit of fatigue, uh, maybe some back discomfort, uh, et cetera. Less common, you can have a little bleeding. Um, just like when you donate blood, you've got to be careful when you stand up quickly. You don't, we don't want patients to faint. Um, these other things that can occur are, are things that sometimes happen with different types of anesthesia. You can see here very rare complications when it says 1%. These are way less than 1%. But when you add them all together, then um, usually about 0.3 to 0.4% of patients will have something like um, an infection, um, some uh, a numbness, um, stay in the hospital because maybe they fainted or something like that. Um, Life-threatening uh, or incapacitating complications, almost never, um, but on occasion in a patient who uh, may start the process with bad heart disease, this is why we try to avoid doing any patients like this, you could have other things that, uh, that can occur. Um, how about PBSC collection? Um, the most common side effects are discomfort associated with the bones. The medicine that you give, GCSF, um, that causes uh, a circulation of those bone marrow stem cells uh, can cause back pain, bone pain, a little bit of headache, um, IV site pain. Now, the thing to keep in mind about this is that these aren't too the, – the pain. it's hard to call it pain. It's more like discomfort. Uh, you feel like you're coming down with a, a cold or something. Um, so it's it's usually not too bad. Um, less common side effects you can see here, um, and uh, more serious things uh, that, that can happen as well. Um, there's a very rare side effect of splenic rupture. It occurs in 1 in 10,000 or less. Don't go play football right after you donate your peripheral blood stem cells. Okay. Now, how is donation going to affect you um, day by day? First, you need to get cleared. In other words, you need a physical exam and blood test at least a week prior to transplant, and sometimes this will happen up to a month prior to transplant. Um, then, uh, as long as you're cleared and everything is good, um, uh, you'll move forward with the procedure. Um, the bo bone marrow donation, um, once you get that clearance done, you're going to your recipient is going to have preparative chemotherapy starting, and that lasts somewhere between 5 to 10 days, sometimes a little bit longer. Then what happens is um, on the day of or sometimes the day before they plan to infuse the bone marrow, they will have you go to the operating room. You'll have your harvest done. Um, what we generally recommend is after that you avoid vigorous physical activity. You don't schedule um, you know, a soccer game for a couple of days after. Um, take it easy for a few days. Um, you're generally back to work within a few days um, after the, the bone marrow procedure. The PBSC collections, um, the donor clearance again takes about 7 to 10 days. You get your chemo starting on your recipient. Um, the last 5 to 6 days, you'll then start daily GCSF shots. Now that sometimes will be done at the, at the center where the uh, procedure is going to be done or sometimes at home if insurance allows it and if you're willing and able to give yourself a shot or have someone who's willing to give you a shot. Um, this is a simple shot under the skin like an insulin shot. It doesn't have to go in your muscle um, so it doesn't hurt too much. Um, the PBSC collection starts on either day four or five after the GCSF is given um, and that collection will occur. Um, usually through a, a standard IV, but on occasion people don't have good veins and on occasion they may need to put in a, a bigger catheter and sometimes you have to have anesthesia in order to get that catheter. The collection continues for one to two days, on occasion a third, and the aches and discomfort are generally gone within uh, one to two days. Um, so that's how the PBSC collection works. What about children? Um, children as young as three months, and actually this is the only reported one. I've heard of other children, even younger, have been donors and can safely do that. They've donated all of the things, bone marrow, peripheral blood stem cells, and getting the neupogen prior to a bone marrow harvest. They've also done that as well. Um, some states and countries require that they have an independent advocate or a court advocate because they're um, children and they can't make um, uh, uh, they can't give true consent. Um, studies have shown that, that children um, uh, tend to do a little bit better. Um, they s can also on occasion have serious complications similar to adult studies, way less than 1%. Um, children tend to report less pain and they tend to recover more quickly than adults. Um, 
this is a map of recovery. So these are patients who've given peripheral blood stem cells and bone marrow. And what you can see is this is when the donor says, I'm 100% back to normal. Um, so what that means is on occasion people may feel like, oh gosh, am I a little stiffer than I was before I did the bone marrow harvest? Or, or do I feel you know, a little bit of local tenderness there? And what you can see here is for purple blood stem cells, within um, uh, you know, two weeks, 90% of patients feel back to normal. Um, by the time you get out to 90 days, 99% feel back to normal, and then you know, at 180 days, you're a little bit better. Um, bone marrow, it takes just a little bit longer, and that's mainly because, again, people are, if someone taps them back there where they've had, uh, where, the, where their bone is in a healing process, um, then they might feel just a minor amount of tenderness. Now, um, what I want to spend just a couple minutes, I don't want to get, um, uh, actually, let me finish with this one first. So what to do to make sure your donation goes well. Um, be careful about having uh, too much alcohol during the process because it can increase your liver function test, and then everyone's going to be all worried about you, and, and um, uh, you know, you're going to get a bunch of extra tests and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's nice to avoid that. Same goes for unnecessary medications and herbal supplements. Um, the bottom line is you just don't want to do things that are going to be tweaking your blood tests or your livers. Um, also, you want to try to do what you can to avoid getting sick because the last thing you want to do is, is get a terrible infection and, and um, be at increased risk when you undergo your anesthesia if you're going to do a bone marrow harvest. Um, important to tell you who pays and what happens if there are complications. Now, um, the, the recipient insurance will pay. Um, in fact, uh, uh, essentially, people, when they get approval, it is the recipient insurance that is, is lined up to take care of everything. Um, now, what if there are long-term issues? The recipient insurance pays the initial issues, but then what's going to happen is if you have some sort of a chronic ache or something that you think is associated with um, the donation, um, what will generally happen is your own insurance will eventually um, pick that up and take care of it. Um, so how about studies? Should you participate in studies? Um, I highly uh, suggest it. There are a lot of things we um, uh, like to know about donors. Um, there's not enough known about safety and psychological well-being of related donors, um, and so I, I encourage it. Donor studies usually don't change anything that you do as a donor. What they usually do is just follow you and see if you're going to have any complications. Sometimes, if the recipient is having uh, is going to require more donate, you know, more peripheral blood stem cells or bone marrow donated than would usually be donated, they have to ask your permission for that, and they'll let you know. But um, in general, the, the studies that you'd participate in won't um, cause a lot of harm. Now, just in the last two minutes, I don't, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but I want to talk to you a little about related donor safety study, a big one that we did. This study, um, papers are going to be coming out about this. Uh, we've already published two papers on psychosocial health associated with donors. Um, this was done at 54 different centers um, uh, uh, from 2010 to about 2015, um, and we looked at the, the way patients felt during the process um, and, and how they recovered. Um, and uh, let me just show you quickly what things look like here. Um, we, we, you know, again, pain is... is only very severe pain, which occurs in a very small percentage, would you really call pain. Most of this, most of what we experience during the donation process is something that I prefer to call discomfort. And you can feel it in all different areas. Um, uh, you know, uh, you get a little bone discomfort when you take the GCSF. It makes you feel like you're coming down with a cold um, or flu. Um, this is self-reported. You basically say, uh, how bad is your pain? Um, it's usually none or mild. In other words, I feel something, but it hardly is bothering me. If it's moderate, it's, it's making you feel like you ought to take something. Severe means you don't feel good enough to go to work. And disabling, which uh, almost never happens, uh, would mean that you'd really need serious pain medications. Um, we also looked at a whole bunch of other things that can occur. You can experience fever, get a little tired, you can have a local reaction, nausea. Um, these are mainly complications that occur with uh, anesthesia and sometimes um, with the, the nupogen.
Now, looking at that, um, first I want to talk just a little bit about older donors. Um, many older donors are now donating uh, because uh, we figured out ways to treat patients who are over age 60 and 70 um, uh, with uh, uh, what we call reduced intensity or reduced toxicity approaches. Um, uh, this is an experience of about uh, just over 250 donors who are over age 60. And what you can see from this experience is that the majority of the donations occur in the age uh, of 60, but we had 10% um, of those donations uh, occurring from 70-year-olds. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, I'm going to go over a few different things. What you can see here is that more women than men needed a central line placed. And if you had to have a pharesis or collection over many days, then almost everyone needed a central line as well. Now this is, as you get older, you're more likely to need more than a single day of collection in order to get enough bone marrow to do a safe um, uh, count. Um, your platelets can fall over time, so we watch people very carefully and make sure they don't have any bleeding. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, talking about platelet counts again. Um, sometimes uh, patients' platelet counts can go down uh, less than 50,000, putting them at a little bit of an increased risk uh, for bleeding. This is an, these are uh, grades of um, uh, what we call skeletal discomfort or the common symptoms that I mentioned. As you, what you can see, and this is an important thing to understand, about 30% of people above age 60 have some baseline discomfort to begin with. Um, and uh, when you get your um, uh, peripheral blood stem cells, uh, your GCSF, you can see that goes up to um, close to 70%, and it's getting better uh, over that month uh, period, like I mentioned uh, earlier. These are the different things that can occur. A uh, few patients are going to have some back discomfort, headache. Um, these are different areas of the bones that are uncomfortable. You can have a little bit of discomfort in the neck, et cetera. Um, I did this donation myself, and I felt a little bit of discomfort right in the back of my neck um, on uh, mainly day four. On occasion, you can feel really fatigued. About a third of patients feel fatigued. Sometimes they have trouble sleeping. Um, I always recommend a little Tylenol before bed. Um, now, um, what we noticed is females were less likely to, to return to normal rapidly. Um, and if you had some discomfort when you started, it was, it, you were more likely to have higher levels of discomfort, and that makes sense. Bone marrow donation occurred in nine patients above age 60, and they had pretty much, actually they had less pain than the younger donors. So in conclusion, patients older than 60 um, do okay, you know, they, uh, they uh, do surprisingly well. In fact, they have a better attitude. Uh, our our um, quality of life studies show that they, uh, they psychologically did uh, better than younger donors. Um, how do younger donors compare to unrelated donors? Well, um, we looked at a large population here, uh, about 920 uh, of peripheral blood stem cells and 120 bone marrow donors and all sorts of unrelated donors, and we did some direct comparisons. And here's what it looks like. Um, the um, related donors um, don't have quite as much overall discomfort. Remember, this is grade one. You hardly feel it. This is grade two. Maybe I'm going to take something. Uh, grade three, for sure I'm going to take something. Um, and you can see that the the related donors, who are in general a little bit older, had just a little more discomfort uh, during the procedure compared to the unrelated donors who are generally a little bit younger. Same thing with the symptoms associated, uh, uh, and these are, this is bone marrow donation that I'm showing you. Um, the peripheral blood stem cell donation, same thing uh, as the bone marrow donation. Um, the related donors, because again, they're a little bit older in general, they feel a little more of discomfort. More of them might need to take some Tylenol or take some other pain medicine uh, at their peak, and then they begin to recover. Um, and these are symptoms, again, in the peripheral blood stem cell donors. Now, one thing that's important to understand is that uh, related donors can have what we call comorbidities or um, health issues. And I just want to show you. Uh, what can occur uh, with the different types of health issues. Um, 
Uh, bottom line with the health issues is that the presence of a comorbidity means the donor is more likely to have a little discomfort or symptoms. And, and that makes sense. If you have a chronic health problem, then um, it, it's more likely that you're going to, uh, you know, be a little more uncomfortable during the procedure. Now, um, for pediatrics, I'll go through this very quickly as well. We had about 300 patients who are pediatric, um, and we show almost the same thing. Uh, this is youngest, uh, age 0 to 6, a little bit older, and the oldest ones. Now, interestingly, the oldest, the, the one the group that was affected more than any of the other group was teenage girls um, who tended to have more discomfort uh, and a little bit less uh, fully recovered uh, compared uh, to younger donors. And that was uh, true both for um, pain and symptoms actually weren't all that different, uh, not, not quite as different as, as, uh, as the pediatric donors got a little bit older. So the conclusion from that study basically is that um, younger donors have similar um, pain and symptoms. Um, adult donors have more discomfort at baseline, um, and uh, they recover just a little more slowly, and you can imagine that. But still, the, the vast majority of them recover and do well and are very happy to donate again if they're asked. Um, a little more persistence in symptoms. Comorbidities can increase your risk a little bit. So in summary of the whole talk here, I want to just emphasize that related bone marrow and peripheral blood stem cell donation is generally safe. Um, uh, the most common symptoms are very mild to moderate short-term discomfort and fatigue. Um, no long-term problems uh, have been noted with bone marrow function. Um, women, uh, older and heavier donors have a slight increased risk of, when I say complications, what I really mean is discomfort um, uh, or some of the other symptoms. The act is voluntary and you have the right to refuse and donor studies can help us learn and may benefit future donors. So my bottom line here is if you choose to donate, thank you so much uh, for your generous gift, and I'd be more than happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Paulsifer. That was an excellent presentation that covered a lot of ground, and I certainly learned a lot, and I hope that those on the call did as well. Um, there are some questions, I think, uh, that we can answer here. Let me get to them. Um, uh, Pauline asks, uh, she said she had read there were a handful of cases where donors have developed blood cancers after receiving Neupogen injections in preparation to donate stem cells. Has the ongoing study shown whether there is, in fact, a risk? So this is a, a great thing that I am very happy to answer because I actually published um, uh, a couple of years ago a study of over 10,000 peripheral blood stem cell donors. And we did a very careful comparison. One of the challenges you have uh, is that an, a, a certain amount of individuals will get blood cancers no matter what. So you, you, um, what you need to do when you're trying to sort this out is figure out um, whether you've caused an increase in the, in the risk um, by using the GCSF um, or whether that individual was just going to get cancer anyway. So we did a very detailed study. And interestingly, we showed that for um, unrelated donors, um, their risk for getting cancer was actually lower than the general population. And uh, with this huge study, it was a great relief to all of us. So currently, we do not believe that normal donors have an increased risk of getting blood cancers associated with GCSF treatment. Thank you. Um, I, the next question is from Colleen. She says, I am a, pot a potential donor for my sister through a clinical trial at the NIH. Their donors get injections of filgrastum for five days prior to donation. Is this a different medication than what you were describing for the stem cell procedure? It is not. Filgrastum is a long, complicated name that's the same as GCSF. Okay. Um, another question from Jane. My sister lives in another state, and it would be a hardship to travel to her hospital. Can the bone marrow or stem cells be collected where I live and shipped to her hospital? 
This has happened in some cases. The National Merit Donor Program that coordinates unrelated donors has in some cases been able to arrange to do a bone marrow collection um, and, and have that shipped. That would, however, have to have insurance approval in order to do it. I've also had instances where a local transplant center has been willing um, to do the harvest um, outside of the National Marrow Program. In other words, they can go to a bone marrow tra transplant program uh, close by and have that occur as well. It takes a lot of coordination on the part of both centers um, because uh, it's a lot easier to get insurance approval when the donor is at the center where the transplant is taking uh, place. But um, uh, believe me, most centers are, are, will work hard to try to, to find a place uh, uh, to get that done if you simply can't go to the local center. So it's a little bit more work for them. But um, if, you, if you simply can't do it, then ask about those, those options. And if, if life is good and insurance can approve and you can find a local center willing to do the procedure, you can do that. Great. Thank you. Um, Joe asks, can I choose whether to donate bone marrow or stem cells? You absolutely can. Um, in fact, what happens is um, when you are asked to donate, uh, you generally will have someone tell you what they would prefer. But um, you should at the same time say, please tell me about both methods of donation. And if you prefer one over the other, you can make that choice. Now, um, they will also inform you of the risks. So for example, um, there is a disease called aplastic anemia, which is a bone marrow problem uh, where your bone marrow has failed, doesn't work very well. There was a, a very nicely done study that shows that bone marrow is superior to peripheral blood stem cells because it causes less graft versus host disease and better overall survival. So under that circumstance, you still could choose to give peripheral blood stem cells. And in fact, sometimes your bone marrow center would say, we don't want you to give bone marrow because it's not going to be good for your health because of uh, maybe a condition that you might have. But um, uh, if you can give bone marrow, it is better for the recipient. So what you're going to have to do is uh, take your preference into consideration and realize that in certain cases, it does matter whether you uh, offer bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells. In some cases, the outcomes are the same either way. Um, uh, but uh, do take that into consideration as you make your decision. But you are the ultimate decider. If you decide that you only want to give peripheral blood stem cells or that you only want to give bone marrow, um, then that's, uh, that's something that uh, generally people will respect. Um, another question is, does my employer have to give me time off work to be a donor? Um, so that's a good question. Um, Usually, uh, have to is a difficult situation. Most employers are reasonable and will work with you, but um, there are uh, certain circumstances where you may have a situation where your employer doesn't want to give you that time off. In that circumstance, you might ask for, uh, for FMLA, which is the Family Medical Leave Act, um, because uh, your donation can be absolutely considered essential caregiving um, uh, to an individual in your family. Now, um, when you get FMLA, um, you won't have the ability to get paid for that, uh, but at least you can, in many circumstances, um, your, your uh, employer is obligated to give you some time off to, to go deliver it. But um, uh, like I mentioned, hopefully uh, you can reason with your employer because you can generally limit it um, if you're only going to be there for the donation process. You can, you can generally limit the time. Thank you. Um, and another question from Pauline. She says, I have chronic migraines. I have read that I cannot take NSAIDs. Is this just a week prior to the transplant, or does this continue afterwards, and if so, for how long? And then the second part of the question is, what painkillers are safe to take, excluding Tylenol, which does not work for my migraines? I also take triptans. Is this safe? Ah, okay. Well, um, so this what I would recommend you would do is, is speak to your um, uh, transplant center about specifically. The reason why is um, the, the um, 
transplant center, if they're telling you not to take NSAIDs, they're concerned about uh, an increased risk of bleeding that can be associated when you take um, something like Motrin and it's still on board. Um, aspirin, if you ever take it, it affects your platelets for a long time and you have to be off aspirin for at least seven days. Medicines like Motrin, or, um, uh, I, which is ibuprofen, or other NSAIDs, they affect your platelets only when they're in your system. Um, so you might be able to work out with them that you can continue to take um, Motrin, et cetera, early on, but then you'll need to stop right before your collection. Um, if your pain is more significant during your collection, there are other medications they can substitute that won't um, increase your risk of bleeding. But do talk to your transplant center about that so they can know your concern. Thank you. Um, okay, I believe that is, oh, I've got another question. We've still got time. Um, George asks, if I donate bone marrow for my brother, does that guarantee he will be cured? Absolutely no. Um, it guarantees that you're a wonderful brother. But one thing that I should uh, make sure that you, that you and all donors should understand, when you donate, you've done all you can. Um, once you've do donated, then it's all up to um, the um, uh, combination of good luck, whatever the disease has, uh, that the, you, your sibling has, um, whether they end up developing complications, uh, et cetera. Um, in other words, uh, when patients go through transplant, they're there for a real reason, and that is they either have cancer or a life-threatening disorder. Um, no transplant is 100% successful. There is a chance that a bone marrow donation um, uh, can, can result in the bone marrow working just fine, but then the patient relapses. Um, and that's not your fault. Um, in fact, nothing that happens during the procedure is your fault. You're just the good guy uh, who does the right thing. Um, and you should never feel guilty or sad no matter what the outcome. Well, I shouldn't say that. You should never feel guilty about the outcome because, uh, again, that outcome is not up to you. That outcome is, is up to the disease that uh, the patient is facing and the many potential challenges that could occur. Okay. Um, another question from Colleen. How long is the procedure or surgery for donors that donate bone marrow? So this depends totally on the volume um, that's being taken. If you are an adult donating to an adult, then generally they uh, will remove somewhere between um, two to four cups of your bone marrow. Um, that can take a couple of hours. Um, and uh, then, of course, there's time to get the anesthesia and recover from the anesthesia. So. Um, the longest harvests from you going into the operating into room until you're out of recovery can be up to four hours. If you're a younger patient or if you're an adult donating to a very young patient, the volume that they take is very small, maybe a cup or two cups at most, and uh, oftentimes that can be done in an hour of operating time. But uh, somewhere between one to four hours, again, depending on the volume that has to be harvested. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Pulsifer. It looks like we've answered all of our questions. Um, so we appreciate your time and this wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone for listening and for posing your questions. And enjoy the rest of your evening.